So, hello everyone. Uh, this is the third and our last uh, live stream from Korea. Today we have with us our AD carry, Jesper Sven Svenningsen. Hey. Uh, so hello. Just before everyone gets warmed up, tell how you're doing, what's been going on. I mean, I know it's midnight there, right? Mm -hmm. So, we've been in Korea now for three weeks. The team has been here for two weeks and uh, we're leaving in a few days for China and we're starting to wrap up the boot camp so we can go to China and play Worlds and yeah. So for everyone who's joining us on Facebook, um, this stream is brought to you by PaySafeCard. PaySafeCard is a prepaid system. Um, you can just get the voucher, you don't need any credit card or anything and you can use it in web shops like Steam or League of Legends, in the PlayStation Store, or even Spotify. So, guys, be active on Facebook. Everyone who's gonna ask good questions, I'm gonna later say our code phrase. You have to send it as a Facebook message to G2 Esports, and you might get a PaySafe card pin worth 10 euro, 10 dollars. And yeah, so be active. We've pinned uh, the rules of entry. You must be from one of 45 countries where Passive Card is working. So let's see how it goes. And yeah, yes, first. So don't want to keep you waiting. Let's jump into <laughs> first questions. We've got a bunch also from Reddit. Um, first of the questions, like very simple. What do you like the most about the bootcamp? I think the best thing is that you get to scream teams that are not from Europe. So you get to scream teams from Korea or China or America, which gives you better scrims than you usually get. Also more like varied scrims. You don't scream the same team over and over again like you do in EU. You scream like four different regions uh, that we're not used to. So it's better practice. The teams are better and the teams are different. So it's good practice. That's the mo most important part. That's why we're here anyways. I believe I'll have to repeat this question for people who are joining later, but generally, what do you think about our group at Worlds? Uh, we know as of today that Fenderbahir has joined our group. Uh, how do you feel about it? Well, I do think that FB is a worse team than C9, uh, which was the other team that could go into our group. So I'm, I guess it's nice that we didn't get C9, uh, but I do think our group is a very tough one anyways. Uh, I think RNG and Samsung are both very tough teams compared to what you could have gotten uh, with those seeds. So I think we have a pretty tough group, but I'm not afraid of the group. I think we can make it. Okay. Um, also, how do you evaluate estimate chances of G2 at Worlds this time? I don't think there is such thing as uh, chances of making uh, groups or semis or finals or whatever. I think that's really not how it works. I think every year you make S tier lists and you say this team's gonna make it finals and this team's gonna win and then that team fails in groups like for example LGG in my first world run was supposedly a finalist or a champion, uh, potential champion for that, that year and they didn't make it out of groups so I think there's no such thing as like percentage of you making it or whatever. I think it's just, yeah. Um, I've got a few like maybe more fun questions like obviously as of today it's on the front page of reddit the interview you guys did with Inven was a pretty funny one and uh, <laughs> when you were asked what's been fun for you in korean solo queue uh, you said that you've been getting a couple of death threats so i, I was like <laughs> what about is that H how it comes uh just uh, some china China's Loki player said he would uh, kill me and my baby in China. Not sure what that means, but yeah. It's always fun getting flamed by people that don't speak English so well, so you get these funny things. But yeah. But it's, not because, not it's not because you did something bad in game, right? <laughs> no, no. Okay, I see. Um, also, from that interview, the funny moment, um, well, not funny, but interesting thing was that Trick said, that you are more hardworking than his previous Korean teammates. What is your personal opinion and uh, what what's so special about your working mentality? No, it depends what each person defines as hardworking, but I think I do everything I can to be the best best player and best person and the best team 
uh, like first part team teammate that is. I don't know like what to say about it. I just do my do my best to be the best player, best teammate, and best person I can be every day. Um, Topias Mercali Mercalio on Facebook is asking, how did scrims versus long go? Because Joey said that you guys got some scheduled. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, our scrims against almost every team has been somewhat 5-5, uh, like 50% win-lose. But I don't think winning and losing is the most important thing. I think how the games, like how productive the games are is what's most important. And I think overall our scrims against Longsu are good both win-lose wise and, and in terms of how much we improve from them. So I think they're going well. Um. Another question by uh, from Facebook by Ramon. He's asking, do you think Misfits are doomed with uh, WE going into the group? I don't think that they're doomed, but I think that their chances of making out of groups are low because uh, TSM and WE are stronger than them, in my opinion. But I don't think that there's uh, no hope for them. I think they have a chance. Um, another question from Facebook, Calvin van den Berg is asking, now that the groups are revealed, what teams in your opinion will make it out of groups, like every group? I don't know about like every single group, but I think TSM will make it out of that group, and either probably World Lead will make it out of that group, I think Longsu will make it out of groups, I think SKT will make it out of groups, and then the rest, I don't even know, honestly. I think there's almost every group right now is uh, pretty, like, I think the groups this year are very equal compared to the other years. I think other years there was, like, one group was a death group, and two groups are, like, free wins for certain teams. But, so I think this year it can be, almost everything can make it, I think. Every group is very balanced, I would say. But I think the clear favorites, of course, the Korean teams, I think, in Group D, TSM is very favored to make it out of groups. Uh, I think the group with Longsu has uh, three candidates to make it out of groups, honestly. So I think very balanced groups outside of the Korean teams and TSM. They should have, they should make it, I think. Um, Lex Brioche is asking, how do you feel about the Caitlyn changes, uh, namely being able to uh, proc headshot on turrets? Um, the thing is, the Caitlyn change is on a patch that Worlds not played on, so I actually don't play Caitlyn right now because I want to avoid champions that are like not enabled for Worlds or like not buffed or whatever for Worlds. And Caitlyn is not buffed on the Worlds patch that we're playing on, so I avoid her in solo queue since she's changed there. So I actually don't really have anything to say about that. Same thing for things like Orn or uh, sensor changes. I don't know how good they are because I don't practice on that that patch. Uh, scripts are played on the old patch 7.18, so I'm not actually sure, but it sounds good. Uh, the changes to sounds pretty good. Um, we had a question on Reddit from Sysnek, it's just related, so I want to drop it in. Uh, what is your personal ADC rank order for the world's patch? Like champions? Mm, Kalista is the clear S tier champ, uh, she's just too good in competitive play. Uh, she's hard to balance because of competitive versus solo queue, so she's the best champion. I think after her, Saya is very good. Saya with Rakan is a little bit better, so I think Saya is very good. I think Tristana, I think Kokmo is good. These champs are very good with sensor, which is a very meta thing in Worlds. Um, I think these are the four most played uh, AD carries. I think certain champions like Varos works pretty well as well with the Quinzo's Rage Blade. I think you can play niche things like Sivir if you want to, or Ash, or Draven, or these kind of things. But generally, I think the best is Kalista, and then Sayak, Stana, Kokmo. Um, Ivan Desposito is another ADC question. Uh, what, what AD carry you prefer to play, and how do you choose the best one for each game? Which AD carry is what? Um, which uh, AD carry do you prefer to play, and how do you choose the best one for each game? Mm, well, it depends. Sometimes you choose a champion for laning phase to like win lane and snowball them there, and sometimes you have to choose 
something for the team comp. If your team comp is full of tanks and like iron sensor support, tanks, CC, low damage, then you must pick something that carries really hard, like Twitch or Kogmo. But if your team has a lot of damage but zero CC, then you might have to pick something like Varus to make your team comp better. So it just depends what they have and what you have. Also, certain champions count each other, like, for example, if the MTMS is very carried, you can just pick Draven and you can go for the lane snowball. So it depends on team comps always. So yeah. I, I always, in competitive play, I always pick for the team comp, whatever my team needs. Hyper carry, uh, engage, Ash Varos, um, you know, team fighting's power, like Severe or something. So it just depends on team comps always. Um. Replay account Fisher on Facebook is asking, have you guys been able to adapt well to the patch? Did you find a really good grasp on the meta? Mm, I think I don't think we have a complete grasp of the meta, but I think the last few days we're getting closer to like wrap up what is our grasp or like what is our idea of the meta. So we have like our picks and our bands prepared, I think. I think a few more days of scrimmage, which we have left, uh, and we will have like a good idea of what is our style coming into Worlds. So I think, yeah. Um, Dieter Tate is asking, have you guys watched the play-ins of Worlds? Any impressions on the teams that made it out? Uh, we scrim during the play-ins. Um, we practice during the play-ins, so we don't get to watch every single game. But I do. I have seen some of the games. I think that Lion could have made it out of groups had they been in another group. I think that they're probably the best uh, of the wild cards, it seems. But I'm not really sure, honestly. I think every major team seem to do pretty well. They stomped their opponents. Uh, so yeah, I think everything went as I thought it would. And I think Lion was standing out a little bit. They were better than I thought they thought. So yeah. Um, again, a patch question from Matt Mortada on Facebook. Do you think that the fact of not making the usual Worlds patch this year will close the gap between EU and A teams and Koreans? Mm. I don't think it matters like for that, but I think it's nice that there's no Mordekaiser running around or Gangplank being overpowered. I think that that's nice, but I don't think that it makes EU or NA closer to Korea in that regard. Uh, I think it doesn't really matter f for that, but it's nice for all teams that there's no super OP champions like Mordekaiser and Gangplank running around. Um, a funny question here from Kirill on Facebook. He's asking, do you think... Uh, Perks can clap Faker again. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're not playing against SKT, uh, most likely until the quarters, at the very worst, uh, at the very earliest, whatever you, you'd say. So, but I have confidence in, in Luka to do well against any mid laner. <laughs> Although the game is not so 1v1 or 2v2 based anymore, so... But yeah, I have confidence in all my teammates to win lane if they have to. Um, ha Hung on Facebook uh, was asking, do you think Gigabyte Marines have a chance to make it out of groups? What is, well, if you have any thoughts on future of Vietnam League of Legends? I mean, I don't honestly have no any idea about Vietnam League of Legends, League of Legends but I think that Marines are a very different team. Like at, I mean, at MSI, they were very... Very, very different. Their picks were nothing that anyone else played, and they had this lane swap thing going for them at uh, MSI, uh, which caught some teams off guard. And I think that Marines are like one of the best wild cards I've ever like seen or play against. Um, I think that they have they have hope in their group. Yeah, I think that they can definitely take some games and make it. I don't think that it's necessarily likely, but I think they can do it. Um, we have another question from. Uh, Ross um, and is asking um, last year EU would win early but struggle around Baron and lose team fights. This year the opposite seems to be true. Is this something that has been worked on this year for G2? Mm, I don't think we necessarily work on that only but I do think that the meta just is the way that there's so much more late game focused team comps nowadays with Iron Sensor being played. There's a lot of tanks like Maokai and Chogath, uh, Sejuani, Joran. These champs are very popular, so there's a lot of tanks, a lot of hyper carries, and this happens to be that the games are late game focused now. Whereas last year the meta was very carry focused in top lane, and uh, there's a lot more Elises, a lot more Jays, a lot more um, Kennen, these kind of champs, so the games were faster. 
but I think we improved a lot on our late game this year. We can put a lot on our Baron play. Like once we actually got Baron, we actually know how to end the games now. And we also know how to get how to get Baron. We didn't actually do that well last year with that. So yeah, we improved a lot, but not only on that, you know, we improve on everything. Uh, I'm going to have a short advertisement break here. Um, I just want to read the first group of names. Um, drop G2 Esports a message. If you happen to be of one of 45 countries where PaySafeCard is working, then you're going to get a pin worth 10 euro, 10 US dollars. I'm also going to show you um, the code word which you have to send in your message. So basically, you have two things that have to be done. The question you ask us on Facebook and you send this code word. So the code word is very easy. It's Lord Jesper. <laughs> For those who can't see it, this time I really wrote it in like black fat marker. Lord Jesper. You can also rewatch videos. And the names are, sorry if I mispronounce anyone, um, Topias, Ramon, Calvin, Lex, Ivan, Replay Account Fisher, Diete, Med, Kirill, Ross, and Ha, Ha Hung. So, yeah, th with this out of the way, everyone try to be active on Facebook. You still got your chance to win. We'll be going for another probably half an hour or so. So, looking forward to your questions. And, yeah. Back, back with you, Jesper. <laughs> There's a question someone um, on Reddit, Telemonish, wanted to ask, expect personally, but we've got voted for you, so he, he's just asking. Um, in the MSI documentary um, that we had, expect said the language barrier really hindered him from making calls, especially in early stages of the game. Has he improved his English since then? If you could give a rough estimate, how much do you think the language barrier has impacted G2 historically and currently? Mm, I think historically it's been a problem, but not like the reason why things sometimes fail for us. But I think ever since like this split, he has improved a lot, um, mainly due to him having an English teacher twice a week uh, for maybe six, seven weeks. So his English has improved a lot, um, thanks to the English teacher and the English lessons he's been getting. So I think now the barrier is only one-tenth of the problem it was before. So now that our communication is much better and our, like, in general, like, our communication is much better and easier to talk to each other nowadays. So I think there's no problem anymore with that. Oh, okay, um, I've got some more questions related also to our groups. Um, Sisnek was asking on Reddit, how do you feel about the fourth team in your group, Fenerbahce? Like you said that you feel it's the weakest team, but maybe it's something more to add to this. I mean, I think that they're not the weakest team, but since we can't have Fnatic or uh, WE in our, in our team, I mean in our group, sorry, I think that since there's only Cloud9 or FB, I think that C9 is a stronger team than FB, so yeah. I mean, they are the weakest of those two, um, but they're not a bad team. Um, they're not one we will take, take for granted, so so yeah. I'm not scared of them at all, but I don't underestimate them. I have learned from my mistakes. So. Um, I've got uh, more than three questions asking the same. It was uh, Apoloka on Reddit, uh, Anna Marie Asaf uh, on Facebook. Uh, basically, they were all asking, where do you see yourself in 10 years? What are uh, some things you'd love to do outside of your career? Yeah, that's it. But basically, what, what are your different interests, maybe, or where you see yourself in the future? Well, I don't know how long I'm going to be a pro player for. I don't know how many more years League is going to exist. Um, maybe I'll do something League-related after my career is over. Uh, when I'm done being a pro player, maybe I'll be like an analyst or a content creator or a streamer or caster or whatever, maybe for some years. And if not, I think I always just wanted to. Before I went to become a pro gamer, I was studying uh, computer science and programming um, in high school. So maybe I'll just go back to studying computer science, programming, and networks like I did before. So if everything just suddenly fails or esports is over, then maybe I'll just go back to school and 
continue where I finished or where I left. Sorry. Um, Luan is. I mean, just from me personally, I actually didn't know that you were studying this uh, computer sciences and this sort of stuff. That's pretty cool. Um, jumping back to the question, Luan on Facebook is asking, will Draven be a viable choice this world? <laughs> mm, viable, sure, but optimal, no. That's like kind of the story of Draven is that he's he, you can play him if you want to. Like Some people play Draven in regions like Arrow played in NA, for example, some games, and Hans Simon plays it in EU, but it's not a meta champion. It's not the best champion available to you. But he's niche and he's playable. If you're good on Draven, it's not a bad jump. It's that he's very hit or miss. So I don't think he will be played at Worlds. Maybe one or two games here and there, but yeah. Um, Troy on Facebook is asking, what do your parents say about your career? <laughs> I think at first, my mom was worried about my, my future. My dad was worried about the, the amount of money I could make. Um, I think that... After the first year in Origin, when I lived in Tenerife, and they were a little bit like worried about food and location and the people I was going to live with were like people they didn't know and all these kind of things. But after one year, and they saw like the stages we played on and the country we visited and the money I made and all this the fame and blah blah blah, I think they're all like pretty cool with it and they're very supportive of my career and they try to follow as much as they can. From on Twitter and Facebook and all these kind of things. So I'm very grateful that my family is very understanding of what I do and why I do it. It helps me a lot in my career that my mom, my dad, my siblings, everyone in my family supports me and understands what I do. So yeah, I think they're all very okay with it and very supportive, which is nice. Sounds good. Um... Also, a little bit more down memory lane, Wesley is asking, how do you begin a career in esports? Well, for some people it's very easy. Um, some people are talented, some people get a easy way to join a top team, like I did. And you can say it was gifted to me, but I thought that I was a very good player. I thought that I deserved this kind of opportunity because I think everyone knew I was a good player before I became a pro player. And I think a lot of people knew I was the next big thing. I don't be cocky, but I think it's true. And I got the easy way to join a top team with very famous and popular players like Soas, Amazing, Peke, and Mitty. And a huge team like Origin that was an up-and-coming organization. And I got a lot of exposure and suddenly I'm a big player, right? But for some people, it's much harder. You have to start the grind in Challenge Series. You have to just play Challenge Series. Maybe you fail, maybe you make it. But some people need to make it the slow way of Challenge Series for maybe one year, maybe two years. And then... At some point, you'll make it. For example, Schalke players, they have been in Challenge Series for quite a while, but they finally made it, so this is maybe their their breakthrough, you know, for some of those players. But I think generally the way to become a pro player or an LCS player is start in Challenge Series team. Maybe you can become a better player there. Unless you are a superstar talent rising up, then you can just join an LCS team from the get-go. Well, I think it's also related to another sec uh, question from Calvin on Facebook. During your career, what was your favorite moment? Do you ever miss your origin days a bit? Mm, I miss the friendship we had. It was very different than the one in, in, um, in G2. But I cherish like, almost every moment in esports a lot, especially the moment you're on stage during the open ceremony and you're like doing the wave to the crowd and you just realize that there are so many people cheering for you and your team and I try to like cherish and enjoy the moment when it's happening. Um, so I don't really have one fair moment but I do think that our Worlds 2015 run was very mem memorable from everything like being in Korea for the first time of my life, being five dudes having no idea what to do and stuff like this it was very memorable for me. Very like learning experience for us and I think overall my entire esports career is just one big moment for me. So I try to like enjoy it and be grateful for everything that I'm getting in my life. So yeah, I think everything is just one big moment. Well, I still have people asking for a little bit more specific. So Dory Sloan on Facebook was asking, what was your favorite in-game moment from MSI? From MSI? Hmm. I don't know. Maybe that last uh, 
at last day of uh, group stage play where we won against uh, TSM with our super late game, lose early game, win late game comp where we just hoped they wouldn't end the game and we just tried to farm for almost one hour and then that was a very emotional ending to the game where we had the believe me moment and everything and suddenly we were 4-6 in groups but if we had lost that game, we would have been eliminated from the get-go. So, win that game into the tiebreaker, giving us a free group stage pass. I mean, a free, like, making out groups just there about tiebreakers was nice. And then just us being so happy that we got third place as well. So, we dodged. Uh, SKT was very, very lucky and everyone was very happy. And then, of course, the entire World League match in itself was a huge moment for us. I think everything was a huge moment, like, from the tiebreaker rules to winning against WE to playing as SKT, everything was very fantastic. I think. Um, that, well, I still remember the goosebumps we had watching that game. Um, there was a question. Oh yeah, um, Joey in our live stream mentioned that uh, he was talking to the coaches and managers of the other teams and they actually European teams were collaborating for the first time in history uh, now in Korea so Martin on Facebook is asking do you cooperate with other EU teams on your bootcamp in terms of pick bands scrims and stuff like that uh, I know that Joey talks to our teams about pick bands like what they do and maybe what they could help each other with like what do you guys play a lot in scrims? Uh, we play a lot of this, and you guys play a lot of this, so maybe we'll try what you guys are playing a little bit to see if it's good for us. And I mean, I talked to some other players of my role, not from EU teams, though. I talked to people from NA, people from LMS, people from Korea, but not so much the EU teams myself, but I know that some of the other teams, I mean, some of the other players on my team talks to their uh, role partners or role, the other role, players of their roles from EU teams. So I guess a little bit, yeah. Okay. Um, one strike lol on Facebook is asking, uh, that's probably my favorite question just because I'm curious as well. If you win Worlds, what skin would you choose and why? Mm, it's like a tough one. So first I would think Kalista because it was the champion that I first got famous for playing. And then I was thinking Jin would look very cool with a G2 mask. So that was very cool too. And then I thought, hmm, shit. Those two skin, those champs are already taken by SKT, so that would be like, mm, don't really want another skin for a champ that someone else already chose, right? So then I had me thinking like, mm, what, what should I pick now? And then I was thinking, I'm not really sure what to choose of those two because I want the skin for Kalista, but someone else already has that, so yeah, fuck SKT, you know. So. <laughs> um. Okay, there's a bunch of questions regarding, of course, our group stage games. Um, Sour Analysis uh, was asking on Reddit, and I've got a couple of similar questions. Are you confident enough against Uzi and Ruler? Um, which uh, bot lane you are the most worried in the group stage about? I'm not really worried about either bot lanes, but I think people are sleeping on Ruler a lot. I think this guy is much better than people, like analysts, or opinions uh, make him out to be. I think he's the best virus I've ever seen. I've never played as Uzi before, or Ruler, uh, in a competitive match. So I'm very excited to play against this. I think both bot lanes of RNG and Samsung are very good. Um, so I'm very excited to play against them. But I'm not afraid of them, but I have lots of respect for both bot lanes. They are very successful players. Um, and very good players, so yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Kane Loop was asking, we, we already spoke, uh, he's saying, like, since everyone on your team is praising you as the most hard working player, besides Perks, who doesn't think it's the case, I mean, he's quoting in an interview, how much solo queue do you play during a day or during a regular week? Uh, probably bootcamp and non bootcamp situation. Uh, can I say the last part again, sir? Um, uh, how much solo queue do you play during a day or during a regular week? Probably mm. it's different for normal season and boot camp. Yeah, in, a, in the normal season of a split LCS, it's different than here because we scrim more here. We scrim like one to th three hours more per day than in EU, so it's different. 
But generally, I play like one or two games before scrims. Then in the break, I get food, and then I play one or two games. And then after I'm done scrims, I, well, I don't do Q&As for PaySafe card. I <laughs> usually play somewhere between two to five games, depends on how many, how early I finish my scrims. But in the bootcamp, I will play one, two games in the morning until scrims, and then I'll play two games in the break, and then I will play until 3 or 4 a.m., uh, usually 3 a.m. in the bootcamp, so maybe six to eight games of solo queue on top of our six games of scrims, somewhat like that. But I don't think hard work has something to do with how many solo queue games you play. I think hard work can also be seen as how much you, how many votes you watch, how much you think about the game, how much effort you put into like draft meetings or thinking about the game. Um, so I think each person has their own way of viewing what is hard work. Well, so sorry to stealing those few games from you with pay safeguard Q&A. <laughs> um, Andrea was asking, do you have a hard time balancing personal life with your job as a pro player? Well, there isn't that much personal life, I think, in esports. Um, every person that's in your life is somewhat related to esports. Um, you don't have much time off if you're a successful player. Outside of after worlds, of course, this year I've been home for less than ten days. Um, so it's there's not much friends and family uh, in your life, and every person that you see or talk to is in some way esports related. Um, so yeah, if you want, if you're a good or a player that makes it every tournament, it's hard to have personal life. But I think I balance pretty okay. I talk to my friends and family a decent amount, and I try to like have non-league related conversations with people uh, if possible. So I try, I think. Um, I had a, I mean, it's probably a provoking question from Reddit. Uh, Doneka was asking, would you win a final against TSM? A final? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure about the odds of both us and TSM making to the finals, but I think Right now, we're screaming as TSM in a bootcamp quite a bit, actually. And even if we win more games than we lose, I feel like they're actually ahead of us uh, a bit right now. But if you're playing a finals in one month from now, I think it would be a very close best of five. Um, Ian White was asking, how you feel about Olympics thinking about adding esports to the list, list of medal games? Hmm... I mean, it's, it sounds very fancy to have uh, Olympic Games uh, esports, but at the same time, I can't actually imagine it happening because I think the real world would be way too against it, and it would be such a huge like drama of getting Olympics to make esports, I think. So I think it will never happen, but it would be cool if it, if it was, I think. Um, I had the question from... Lex on Facebook and very similar on Reddit. Uh, they were basically asking about starting items. When, sh you, uh, when should you start with Doran's Blade and when with Doran's Shield on Marksman? And there was a similar one asking, um, wait a second, um, if you should, uh, will you start uh, Relic Shield or Doran's Shield? So maybe you can explain a little bit how that works. Okay, so Doran Shield is something you start only if you have a lane that's very tough. If you're getting poked out of lane, you're playing against something like Caitlyn and uh, Syrah or Lulu or Karma, and they're playing aggressive style, then you can go Doran Shield. It's good against poke, it's good against uh, strong laners. Uh, Doran's Blade is good in winning lanes. When you don't need Doran Shield and you're winning your lane, it's strong. It's better than Doran Shield. It scales better as well. It gives... Uh, more AD and more life steal for the game, which, which is better than Dorn Shield. Dorn Shield is like, after 10 minutes, it's useless item. It only gives 80 HP. Um, so it scales better. Basically, Dorn's played if you don't need Dorn Shield for laning phase to survive at the early levels. As for Relic Shield, I think it's only something you buy if you can afford uh, not buying Dorn Shield or uh, in lane. If you have an easy lane and you have a support that buys Iron Sensor, you can buy Relic Shield to funnel more gold onto your support so you can buy a uh, sensor faster but on the life patch sensor is much nerfed so I'm not sure how worth it is I, I think well shield is not that good
good anymore thanks to the iron sensor nerfs. So I think nowadays just Dorian's blade is better if you can lane the first five levels. And uh, if you can't, then Dorian's shield is better. Somewhat. Great. That, that, I think that's a very clear explanation for the fans. Um, <laughs> Hates Laura was asking on Reddit, you and Mitty have been playing together for a long time now. How do you keep your relationship fresh? I'm not sure what exactly fresh means, but I think what keeps us going or motivated is that we both have the same goal of being the best we can be as players, persons, and teammates. And I think we try hard every day to achieve our goal of you know, winning worlds one day or just winning everything we can possibly win. Um, we're both very, very motivated and I think we work hard to achieve our goal. And I think that's what keeping us fresh. Um, Jans van der Erden is uh, asking on Facebook, whenever you make an epic trailer for a big game, I guess it's uh, he's talking about uh, Riot videos, does it also feel epic for you or just awkwardly looking at the camera? <laughs> it's um, a bit less epic than it looks in the videos, but sometimes you can actually feel cool when you're standing like in the middle of the MSI stage and you're like, doing the riot pose, you know, the this pose and like you get you, it feels cool sometimes, but it's a bit a little bit little bit less epic without the music and like the camera angles. Uh but yeah. It feels sometimes pretty cool to be doing, doing the features and stuff. Looks cool for sure. <laughs> um Sublime to Lime on Reddit is asking said serious question. 5v5 team fight meta with tank, top, and jungle. Most ADCs stick to the late game carry champions like Tristan, Axaya, uh, Twitch, Cogmore, or late dominant Varus and Kalista. Why Wayne is still out of meta? Wayne in lane doesn't really feel weak against them with Caitlyn of the meta. Wayne shreds the front line faster they, than any ADC above. Tell me your opinion about Wayne, please. Uh, Wayne has one problem is that she's very one dimensional, she has no CC. No wave clear, and the only thing she can do is all attack people. So, when all champions have wave pushing abilities or crowd control or engage or even like in the mid game, Vayne has two items, but so does Kogmo with Quinsos and he has Hurricane. He has more damage than you do, and Vayne is also a low range champion, which doesn't excel very well against champions like Maokai or you know champions with targeted CC. On top of her having a bad laning phase, her two items is not that good compared to Kogmo or Kalista, for example. Her six item power spike is very, very OP, I agree. She kills everything very fast late game, but the 20 minutes of Vayne being useless is not worth her late game compared to our champions that are stronger in lane, and yet they still scale pretty well, like Tristana or Saya or Kogmo, even Twitch if you want to have that. And also one problem with Vayne is her wave pushing is terrible. So whereas champions like Saya can Q, alt take and E a wave and almost one shot it. Stana can bomb the wave. Vayne doesn't have anything. She doesn't have tower pushing either, like Stana or Saya or long range abilities like Kogmo. Yeah, she just only has one thing and it's alt attacks and she takes a lot of time to scale. So she's not worth it, I think, over our champions. Understood. Okay, uh, one more ad break and then probably last three to five questions. Uh, just guys, for you who are watching the Facebook uh, live stream, you have the super last chance to win pay safeguard pins. I'm going to read the second batch of names. It's Anna Marie, Asaf, Luan, Troy, Wesley, Doris Lowe, and Martin, Andrea, One Strike, and Yanis. Here is the code word. It's Lord Jesper. And you have to send it to G2 Esports via message. If you happen to be from one of 45 countries where PaySafeCard operates, you're going to get 10 euro, 10 dollars pin. Yeah. So uh, last round of questions. Uh, be active, whoever is watching. And yeah, so jumping into my questions. Um, there was a uh, Kane Loop on Reddit asking, where would you personally rank yourself among the top ADCs in the world, and what would be a top five or top ten? 
Mm, I don't really like rank myself usually. I don't think it's a good thing to consider yourself the best or the worst or whatever, but I'm very confident in my abilities against every AD carry. I think I've played against many, many top tier AD carries and bot lanes over the past last three years. Uh, and I've never like really, really faltered against anyone. I never felt like I was super outclassed by any player or bot lane. So I'm very confident in my ability against anyone, but I wouldn't say I'm better than everyone else or worse. I think I'm very, very good. And I think Mitten and I are a good bot lane, and I don't think we will falter super hard against anyone. Um, I've got, uh, again, a few questions repeating uh, multiple times. Um, Joey and Chris in previous streams said that you've been working a lot on overcoming the struggle of best of ones. How how do you feel? Are we prepared for best of ones? What we have improved? What's the most important? The most important things about best of ones is having a good read on your opponent. Um, being prepared for cheese is very important. Some junglers have very, very cheesy jungle pathings. For example, Condi from WE at MSI caught off guard one game with his level 2 gank bot lane, which basically lost his entire game off of that. Um, I think Cam. Uh, the Marines have their lane swap. These things catch you off guard, so you have to be prepared for cheese and know how to react to it, respond to it in game. So, until having a good grasp of the meta, you always have to be ready for cheese and lane swaps and level two ganks and any kind of like surprises. On top of like just knowing your opponent very well, uh, knowing what style they play, uh, who's their, like, which player is usually the the player that they play for, who is the carry, and who's, yeah, it's a lot of things, <laughs> honestly. Understood. Um, I, I would move to like more simple and quick <laughs> questions. Uh, the question is long, but I think it's quite an interesting one. So we VL99 on Reddit asked, would you choose the blue pill to be the best AD carry in the world, and no one can defeat you? Everyone is calling you the best player in the world, even Bang and Faker fear you, but you can't play for G2 anymore. Or would you take the red pill and stay with G2 and your friends and be the best ADC in Europe? Mm, I think it's pretty simple, the first, the first pill. I mean, I'm very happy in G2 and I enjoy our friendship here, but it's not what's the most important to me, uh, if I find, if I can choose more success somewhere else in terms of winning or being the best I can be, I would gladly choose it over friendship here. And I'm sure all four of my teammates would choose the same. So, yeah. Um, Krisek on Facebook was asking, why did you change your nickname? Uh, I actually wanted to change that uh, way before I did, but I wasn't allowed by Riot to do it in Summer Split. So I had to wait until after Summer Split, and then made the Worlds, so I had to wait until after Worlds. And then we made the IEM, so I had to wait until after IEM to do it. Uh, but basically, all my friends call me Sven, because it's um, a half of my actual last name. So I thought it would be fitting. To change to that instead of uh, Niels, which was just like a name I had as a joke at first, so I never really liked it. It uh, is a real name in Denmark, so it's very weird to call someone a name that's not theirs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I always thought it was weird. Um, so I wanted to change it, but I wasn't allowed to. So yeah, okay. that's the story. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, a few people are asking, actually, what do you think about Ocelot and a word about Daddy Carlos? <laughs> Honestly, I, I gotta admit to you, like, some years ago, I didn't think that Carlos was a very smart man or a very good anything. I just thought, oh, shit, Jitsu sucks, you know, they can't make uh, LCS after multiple splits in Challenge Series. They're like, don't have any teams in any other things than League and they suck, you know, but now that I've gotten to know Carlos, I think he's a very good businessman. Uh, I don't know much about him being a player. I didn't watch much of League back in, back then. But as a businessman, as a person, I think he's very smart. And I think he runs G2 very well. 